So my name is Eric Horn. I'm a physics teacher here at Woodbury Forest School, and I'm going to be attempting to present the laser bouncing problem from the 2016 USAYPT. So this is the full text of the problem statement. The gist of it is that we're going to be creating a medium which has an index of refraction that changes with height, so that when we shine a laser into the medium, the laser's path changes continuously in the medium and can even bounce. And what it asks for specifically is to use the results of a setup like this to come up with a function for the index of refraction of the medium as a function of height from the bottom of the tank. Now we ended up approaching this a little bit backwards where we figured out the index of refraction of the tank through direct measurement and then worked backwards to figure out what type of path we should expect based on some um, theoretical approaches to the uh, changing index of refraction. So, in terms of what's going on here, we are going to be referring to this type of medium as a GRIN, which stands for a Gradiated Index of Refraction. And this setup is going to have an index of refraction which changes as we go upward in the medium. So we're going to start with a higher index of refraction at the bottom, and we're going to change continuously as we get to the top, though we don't, at the onset, know what type of change we're expecting. And then when we go to actually model this, we're going to be treating each layer as a constant index of refraction that it doesn't change with the length or the width of the tank. So our experiment, what we did is we put a layer of caro syrup, which is an index of refraction of 1.5, and then over the top we very gently poured in wire, which has an index of refraction of about 1.33, and then we waited. And what happens over the course of time is that the caro syrup starts to diffuse upward into the water, and as it does this, the mixture of caro syrup and water in the middle will have an index of refraction between the two. And if we wait long enough, there is a somewhat stable, somewhat nice continuous spread of index of refraction between the two. Now this index of refraction versus height, unfortunately, is also a function of time. So when we do all of our experiments, we have to be relatively quick about taking measurements of the index of refraction. Now thankfully, the time scale over which the the dissolving of the caro syrup occurs is on the order of days to a week or so. So we can do an entire experiment in a day and the results are more or less constant. So in terms of the setup, we used a fish tank which we had custom built so that it was very narrow which made it easier for us to set this up because we didn't have to use as much volume of fluids. We have a camera set up here which can see the entire part of the tank and we have some stuff, we have a ruler for scale. And then we have another camera over the top so that we can make sure that we don't have any funny business going side to side, thus ensuring that we have a relatively constant index of refraction in both of the other two dimensions of the tank. And then we have our little green laser over here. And if done properly, the medium will cause the laser to bounce like this. And it will bounce something like this from day three or so to day eight. And the shape of the pattern is relatively constant, even though the chances are that the index of refraction inside is probably changing. All right, we used, in order to collect data on this setup, we took a picture using that camera, and then we used a piece of software called Tracker to actually go in and use the calibration ruler, which you probably can't see, it's very dark here. But we used a calibration ruler to figure out the relationship between pixels in the image and distance. And then we were able to perform measurements of the shape of the laser bouncing path, even though we could not, in some sense, directly measure it. Now, the refractometry is the technique that we're going to use to actually look at what the index of refraction is as a function of height through direct measurement. And we're going to be doing this using a refractometer. So this is a digital refractometer with a relatively high precision. This is typically used for like beer brewing and other kind of homegrown uh, stuff like that. And uh, we would take a plastic pipette and simply pull small amounts of the solution at varying heights and then use the refractometer to measure what the index of refraction is. And if we did that for, I believe we have something on 12 trials here. This is the height in centimeters. So this would be the bottom of the tank where we would expect to have the highest index of refraction. Now this is measured in degrees bricks, but that's 
that corresponds to index of the fraction, so the higher the squares, the higher the index of the fraction, and then so on towards the top of the tank, and the top of the solution was about eight centimeters. In terms of our theoretical modeling, we're just going to turn this into a Snell's Law problem with lots and lots of Snell's Law applications. So we're going to be breaking the entire height of the tank into as many Snell's Laws as we can, and then we're going to be using a Python script to run thousands of Snell's Law calculations, and then wait until we get a critical angle at the top, flip it, and then we'll just run Snell's Laws until we hit the bottom of the tank. And so this shows the concentration gradient that we're expecting, and then the goal is to figure out what this index of a fraction becomes as a function of both the height of the tank and time. Now, we took the experimental results, and in order to plug them into the model, we had to do some interpolation to figure out what those index of fractions were between our data points. And because we don't know what type of concentration gradient should form, we don't have a, if you have this type of solution and this type of solution, you wait long enough, what that index of fraction versus height and time is, we took our results and we fit them the best way we could. And so in this case, we took a fourth order polynomial, which gave us a pretty good fit for this set of data, and then we're going to use this function to come up with the index of refraction values versus height when we go to model. And we understand that this isn't some theoretical from the ground up approach. This is taking our experimental data, interpolating it using a somewhat arbitrary function that does agree well, and then using that to assess whether or not Snell's law is working to model this phenomenon. What this is. Uh, and this is an overlay between our theoretical and experimental results. So the experimental result is the green laser in the background. If you can see it, the theoretical model is matched to it in red here. And the pictures are shifted so that the length scales correspond. So you can see that there's a relatively good agreement there in both the shape and the distance between the bounces and in the height. Uh, the Absolute errors in those three, in the two major measurements that we looked at, the height and the distance, were around 5% for this particular trial. Uh, I think that was consistent among the two or three trials that we were able to do. Um, the, probably the largest source of error that we had to deal with was parallax error. We were making all of our measurements with a camera that was offset from the, the layer that we were trying to measure by a decent distance of a couple feet, but because we were also measuring things in the order of centimeters and we were measuring it from maybe 30 centimeters away, parallax was a significant source of error for us. Um, so overall, we were able to experimentally measure the index of refraction versus height at a particular time. Um, and then we were able to use some theoretical simulations with our experimental index of refraction versus height. And the Snell's Law numeric approximation method seemed to work pretty well in generating results which matched up with what we saw visually. And we do see that we are missing a purely theoretical solution where we have a kerosene water solution and we predict what type of concentration gradient will form. But if we had a little bit better understanding of the chemistry, we have all the rest of the pieces to make the connection between that concentration gradient and what we should see in reality. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I'm Greg Jacobs. I'm the president of the USAYPT, and I'm going to conduct an examination of this problem. We thank you for your presentation, and we just have a few questions. So um, let, me, uh, let me start at the beginning, or at least start at the end, actually, on your conclusion slide. So I understand, if I could summarize properly, you have kind of worked backwards here, right? You have uh, you've started with a direct measurement of the index of refraction with the pipette and the refractometer and work backwards to say, let's model that with a function based on what we see. Is that correct? Yes. And what would you need to get a purely theoretical solution? I mean, I understand that you don't have one, and that's fine. What I what I don't understand is what information would we need in order to construct that information, that, that theoretical solution? Uh, as far as we understand, it's a very difficult problem because you're looking at a diffusion, not only a diffusion rate, but a diffusion profile for two different types of substances. 
which is a little bit outside of my own knowledge base because it is much more chemistry. Though I don't, mm -hmm. I don't make that as an excuse. It just simply that's I don't have as much background to address sure. that question. But the specific things that you would be looking for are some understanding of the diffusion process between the caro syrup and the water, and chemically how those happen. Correct. Yeah. Essentially, what we're looking at is if we started this from scratch, we would have some. You know, index for fraction 1.5, you hit your water interface, it goes down to 1.3, and it's constant there, and there's a jump. And then over time, that is going to start to shift and form an index for fraction gradient. I so we don't have any picture of that. All we do is take the snapshot with the refractometer. Understand. And the refractometer gave us this particular, this particular look, and you curve fit it to a fourth order polynomial. What made you make that choice of a fourth order polynomial? It's very arbitrary. It could be almost any function as long as it gives us a relatively good agreement. Because essentially all we're going to do is we're going to interpolate between our points. So, you know, another method just to throw it out is that you could come in and everywhere in between here, call a linear fit between them, and for every point that we needed in our theoretical model, you just do a linear fit between the points and you pull it and they sort of fraction. Like it's not a better way of doing it, it's just a okay. different way of doing it. This one happens to have a very good agreement. It's very arbitrary. Okay. That, uh, that, answer, that answers my question because I mean you could have modeled with a with a cubic you could have uh, I mean because there's such a small coefficient there but you just you just chose that because that gave you uh, the highest R squared yeah, we, we could have gone and done up to twentieth order polynomials and see True. what the best fit and just right it right. fits perfectly if you if you go to uh, as many data points as you have yeah. okay that makes sense um, let's go back to the experimental uh, approach here so this refractometer um, if you could show me that that picture there yeah you go from here and then your next slide. Yeah, the, uh, you're pulling from a specific location with a pipette, and then the refractometer tells you what the index of refraction is. Is that the right idea? Mm -hmm. How do you know where you're pulling from? How did you control that, and what's the uncertainty on the height in each of those data points? I don't have specific values of the uncertainty. The way we figured out the height of the pipette, I believe, was through the same camera-based measurement that we've done throughout the rest of the problem. Okay. So we were looking from here and then measuring the number of pixels between the bottom of that pet and the bottom here. We have a scale, and as long as we have a rough sense of the parallax that are involved. So in other words, the uncertainty on the pipette height is pretty much identical to the uncertainty that you described it later with like four to seven percent based on the camera angle. Yeah, I don't have the I don't have the numbers for you right now. That's right. Um, um, that's and right. and uh, was there was there, any, uh, was there any jiggle issue here in terms of, you're pretty confident that you got water or a mixture from that precise layer? We are we were pretty confident that we got water from the area around it. Now when you are doing a pipetting like this, when you pull the pipette up, some of the water will adhere to the side of the pipette. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance between taking a small amount so that you only get fluid just in the uh -huh. tip of the pipette. But if you take too small amount as you go up, the water that adheres can change the the concentration right. of the solution. Fair enough. But you, but on your on your graph, on your experimental graph, you did get a, uh, a pretty clear. I, mean, I don't know whether it's necessarily a cubic fit here, but you got a pretty clear um, a pretty clear function here. You're definitely decreasing the index of refraction. So I'm sounds like we're comfortable with how that worked. And is that right? It, yes. That's fair. Um, okay. Let me go to um, your Snell's law model. Now I'm a little confused here. I understand the idea of the Snell's law model. In each case, the light bends away from the normal because you're going from high to low index of refraction. I got that right, right? Yeah. And you're going to break this up into multiple layers and use that to model what the, um, what the form of the laser bounce looks like. How many layers did you use there? In the order of thousands. And okay. we ran the model with an increasing number of layers until we got a stable pattern, at which point we used that similar number of layers for the remainder of them. Okay, that makes sense. And your, yeah, I understand. So at some point it doesn't matter how many more layers you use, right? How did you know the index of refraction difference? You use the, that, that function to stick the difference between the indexes of refraction in that? Yeah, essentially that function, the reason we use that crazy fit is just to give us a continuous function for the index of refraction which is height. So that any two indexes of refraction we need, because we're cutting into a lot of little layers, we have a function for that, we can pull those index of refraction values. So even if the function isn't perfect, at least it gives us any index of refraction we want that fits that the experimental results the best we can. 
that make that makes a lot of sense. So um, let's go back to the results line, overlaying the pictures. Yeah. So this is, if I'm understanding this correctly, this is you took that index of refraction function that you created or that you fit to your data points, then plug that into Snell's law, and this fit back. This is what it should look like. Yeah. Now you told us in your original. Um, presentation that you scaled this to this distance. Is this where the where the where the light is hitting the mirror? Is that where you scaled this to? So what we're saying by scale is if this is 25 centimeters in the plane of the laser, mm -hmm. if I go up to this ruler, that should be 25 centimeters. That is the theoretical overlay is mapped to the physical dimension. Okay. So we didn't necessarily map this to the original slope here. No, we, we map the starting location. So okay. the starting location is anchored. Now, the starting location, though, I'm confused about that because if the light is coming in horizontally, if the light is coming in perfectly horizontally, it shouldn't bend at all. Right? Or did I miss something? Mm, no, no, no. Because, there's no, because of the gradients are horizontal. If it were perfectly horizontally, you're probably right. So did but you, we're dealing with a real laser and a real medium. The index refraction is not perfect. The laser is not infinitesimally narrow, nor is it going to be perfect. Okay, so in other words, you tried to level it, but it's still bent. And, and, so, and it will always bend, because the index refraction, while we may assume it is constant horizontally, there's small differences, and the actual laser path is, there's a spread in the laser itself. True. And so true. that will be bent. And so did you aim the laser at this angle, or did you aim it approximately horizontally? So this is, a, this is an overlay on one of the bounces. So in oh. reality, this is starting back here, but we're okay. looking specifically at the bounce. OK, I understand. I thought I thought the laser was angled here. That that makes more sense now, because even if you did put it approximately horizontally and it bent, it should be close to horizontal here, but it's not. OK, I got that. So you. You didn't fit the slope here. You fit this. You assumed this distance when you plugged into your model. You assumed that 25 centimeters here on your model maps to 25 centimeters on here. So in in generating this, the kind of the big picture is we went through, and you can imagine we don't even have the laser on. We went through. We measured the index of refraction versus height, and using our function for the index of refraction versus height, we plugged into the model and we got this shape, <laughs> which is in centimeters in both directions. And so then what we did is we went. Turn your laser on and overlay it, and you can see how well they match up. Okay, I see what you're saying there. And the um, this height was off by about seven percent, and you said that this is this is as close as we were going to come anyway, based on the parallax error. Yeah, and one other point. Sorry, I forgot about this. The reason we're anchoring here when we compare these is because this is a very easy to mark reference point, whereas when the laser comes in. Any error in the angle measure, any error in the position, you pick up. So if we use the bounce point here, we can eliminate a lot of the error in the initial condition of the laser path. Right. Well, thank you very much for uh, for your presentation. Learned a lot about this one. Um, I'm going to model now the the summary speeches. The opposition gets one minute, and the uh, reporter gets one minute to respond. So um, we thank the reporter for his presentation. The uh, reporter did this backwards. As he described, instead of predicting from first principles, he measured the experimental index of refraction gradient and then fit that to a model. I'm not particularly convinced that a fourth order polynomial was the best fit there, especially given the dearth of data points where the, the line was moving, where the line was curving the most. That said, the reporter addressed that very well and understood the limitations of his model, which is very important part of this process anyway. The model fits within the uncertainty that, that they gave. Um, I would like to see a little more detail about the uh, about the error analysis there. But the uh, the this presentation did what the reporter said it was going to do, and in a very impressive way. Yeah, um, thank you for the great conversation about this. Um, it's been a little while since I looked at this problem, but. Uh, I agree that we definitely did this backwards. And what I would like to do in the future is to take what we've done here and event essentially run it the whole way backwards. And I would like to start with this type of picture and go through and figure out how the slope of the line is changing. Use that to figure out an index of refraction versus height value. And then compare that to our experimental measurements. Now, it would be better to, from base principles, go in and figure out what that index of refraction versus height should be. But because it's a little bit outside of our wheelhouse, we're going to stick to our direct measurement. All right. Thank you.
For more information about this, go to usaypt.org.